Nintendo finally gave us another glimpse of The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild at this year's Game Awards show in the form of a brand new trailer as well as a pre-recorded gameplay demonstration, but we'll be focusing on the demo later. For now, the analysis machine will be focusing all of its efforts purely on the trailer. But before we get started, make sure to check out our previous massive Zelda analysis from E3 if you haven't already. Please? I mean, it's been like four months of that stupid thing. Anyways, with that out of the way, let's get started. So the trailer opens up with a drawing of an eye releasing a teardrop which then creates life, a tree sprouting from the ground. Now that tearful eye is obviously the symbol of the Sheikah people, but its origin has always been shrouded in a mystery. Although in this context, it's pretty clearly meant to be symbolic of the gods breathing life into the world. After all, it's not like this is the first time that an eye has been used to represent gods, as the Egyptians did it a couple of times. So this may give more definitive meaning to that symbol, and perhaps better explains its prominence in Breath of the Wild. Now, this short sequence is just the first of several that pop up in the trailer, each of which sets up the scenes that follow. And as you may have noticed, they all take place in some kind of tapestry and is lit by the flickering light of a fire. And not only can you see embers of the fire floating around, but we actually see the fire itself at the very start of the trailer, which swallows up the Nintendo logo before focusing on the tapestry. So these short scenes are likely stories told by people around a campfire to the younger generation of what happened to them and Hyrule. A little bit similar to the teaser trailer for Moana. Okay, yeah, I'll take any opportunity to talk about how awesome Moana is. At any rate, the scene then fades from the drawn trees to a forest of actual trees, showing what appears to be a natural, undisturbed world. Or at least a part of it. It then transitions again to another forest scene, only this time with trees that have different colored leaves. Specifically, the color of autumn. Now, this in all likelihood is just a different region. After all, the landscape is completely different here. And yet, a small part of us can't help but wonder if seasons might actually play a role in this game. Whether by natural progression through the game, or perhaps by different means. Like the Rod of Seasons. After all, as far as I can tell, this is the first time we've seen trees of this color. The trailer then returns to the tapestry for Act 2, showing what might be the birth of people, or perhaps more specifically, people coming together, with three farmers and a horse tending to the fields. Look, this guy's wielding an axe, this one a rake, and the last one is doing some gardening. Even the horse gets in on the action as it's carrying goods for the farmers to use. Furthermore, the artwork portrays all of this happening in the elements, with what appears to be wind here, followed by rain, and natural mountains. It helps convey the progression of the world from the natural wild place of Act 1 to the more civilized acts to follow. And as you might expect, the scene then fades to our first look at an actual human in the trailer, as well as the first human period that isn't Link or the old man. Anyways, this scene takes place on the stone bridge, which is in stark contrast to the entirely natural scenes before, and that bridge actually has a pair of torches lighting it. Now one question you may have is where exactly does this scene take place? Well, based on the position of this distinctive tower to the left, as well as the Twin Peaks, we know this takes place within the inner portion of Hyrule Field. You know, the portion visible from the northern side of the plateau. In fact, we even found this bridge from a different angle. If we go back to this scene of Link gliding through the Twin Peaks toward the field, we can see the bridge right there, including the very same river that wraps its way underneath. And look, there's a shrine right next to the bridge on the side the guy's walking toward. But in case you're still confused as to the exact location of this bridge, you can see Hyrule Castle to the right, and the Plateau and Temple of Time to the left. Now the person here is potentially interesting for a few different reasons. For one, he's our first actual look at human life off the Plateau, which was expected but is still nice to see. But beyond that, he appears to be crossing the bridge with purpose. I mean, he is armed with a spear after all, as well as a backpack, which likely indicates he's a traveler. Now, it is possible he will just patrol the bridge back and forth, as one might expect of NPCs in past Zelda games. But given the level of realism Breath of the Wild is going for, we wouldn't be surprised if he pushes right on past the bridge and elsewhere into the world. Which would be pretty exciting, as it could mean that Link could encounter NPCs at random, non-predetermined points in the game. Okay, there's just one more thing we should probably point out before moving on, and that's the fact that we can see a seemingly defunct guardian at the river's edge. Now, in contrast to this day scene, the next scene shows off a couple of people fighting off a pair of moblins on a rainy night. Neither of whom are Link, by the way. Yeah, we totally thought the guy here was Link at first, too. Now, at first, this scene doesn't seem terribly exciting. I mean, it's so dark, we really can't make out much of anything in the background, except for a damaged building here and a tower visible way off in the distance. But here's the thing. Despite the lack of Link, this doesn't appear to be a cutscene. And that's a pretty big deal for one major reason because we've never really seen NPCs fight enemies outside of cutscenes before in Zelda. Which means that, at the very least, it seems like they'll fend for themselves. Which granted, they probably have to if they do indeed roam the world like the guy on the bridge. And we can't help but wonder if they might be able to fight alongside Link too. Like, maybe they'll even join you at points for your adventure. It would be pretty darn cool if you could team up with random wanderers to help out. Or maybe you could hire them instead. The trailer then fades to our first look at actual civilized life, with a bunch of people wandering around a building shaped like a horse. Yeah, that's a little weird. And it seems like the people who made this building really have a thing for horses. 
because in addition to the building shape itself, we can see several murals hanging from the sides that feature horses, as well as people and a sun, on top of the lanterns by the entrance being held by horse-shaped statues. Oh yeah, and there's even a guy riding a horse here. <laughs> there's something horsey going on here. Oh wait, that pun only works with fish, huh? Wait, horsey. Seahorse. And seahorses are fish! There we go, I made it work. At any rate, what is the deal with this building? Is it some kind of shop, maybe? Perhaps something related to horses? I know, we're really going out on a limb with that one. Or could it just be a place to gather? Either way, it sure seems to be in the middle of nowhere, surrounded mostly by hills and mountains. In fact, we can even confirm that since we actually located it within the world from a gameplay session at E3. We found it when looking from the northwestern corner of the plateau. There it is! And as you can see, it actually isn't too far away, but there really isn't much else of interest around it. Regardless, it seems to be a pretty busy place, with at least five people milling about. Now interestingly, this location is actually shown in two slightly different scenes. And we notice between the two that some of the people move around, while others don't. Like the guy by the building's entrance here. He doesn't move at all in either scene. And neither does a guy with a white hair. This could mean that these characters are permanent at this location. Whereas on the other hand, the girl here appears to actually move around, even stopping occasionally. But that doesn't mean she's not a permanent character here too, just one that might roam around a little bit. And then we have the guy on the horse, who appears to be missing entirely from the zoomed out scene. But wait a second, who's that walking in the back there? It looks like he's wearing similar clothes as the horse rider. So could they be the same person? It's impossible to say for sure, but if so, where did he get the horse from then? Or why did he get off it? Is that what the building's for? Do you like rent horses here or something? Regardless, the horse rider here seems like he may potentially be a true traveler. He is moving around, and why else would he need a horse but to travel around? Now speaking of the horse, there's something else interesting about it, because it looks like it may be the exact same horse that we've seen Link ride in every other trailer to date. What with a seemingly brown hair, white legs, and distinctive white mark on the face, could this possibly be the same horse, as in maybe Epona? And could the rider here be whom Link acquires it from? Now granted, it is possible it's just a similar looking horse. Although, up until this point, that horse is also the only one we've seen decked out in full gear. Huh. Now, we're not done counting people yet, as there's someone else visible by the campfire in the zoomed out scene. Although we couldn't say they're still there in the zoomed in scene because the horse is blocking it from view. But we did notice that that character seems to fade away as the camera pans out too far, a little bit similar to characters in Ocarina of Time. So this might show the expected range of how far away we can see characters from. But interestingly, the guy over here who we thought might be the horse rider appears to be even farther away and yet is still visible. Is he more important or something? Or perhaps, if he is indeed a true roaming traveler, it might make sense for characters such as him to be visible from long distances. Okay, so that covers it for the characters here. Or does it? Because let's take a closer look at this guy. What's his deal? Doesn't his bag or backpack look a little weird to you, with all kinds of things hanging off of it? Well, after staring at this guy for way longer than I want to admit, we're pretty sure we figured out exactly what he is. He's a painter! Look, the thing hanging off the side is a paintbrush! There are the bristles, and the handle. And that thing on the back? Yeah, it's another paintbrush! Look! Bristles! Handle! But what about the thing sticking out there? As it turns out, it's a paper scroll, similar to the one the Mistral had in the demo. So we're guessing that might be what he paints on. And do you want to see something really wild? Well, do you see his hair there, and how it's kind of pushed up into a bun? Well, the tip of his hair is black. A little bit like a paintbrush with paint on it. Yeah, this guy's pretty hardcore. As for what he actually does within the context of the game for Link, we have no idea. Maybe he'll draw you pictures or maps of some kind, Tingle style? Okay, that's enough about that guy. But there's one more thing I wanted to point out here. There's a dog here! It's so cute! And in the zoomed out scene, we can even see him sniffing around, like dogs tend to do. It's a cute touch, but beyond that, the dog seems to have an impressive level of awareness too, as he appears to be intentionally following alongside the horse rider, even looking up at him. So between that level of awareness and sniffing around, we can't help but wonder if dogs might be able to join Link on his adventure too, and maybe help track things down by sniffing around. And on a similar note, the horse rider here appears to look at the girl as he passes by. Now, NPCs looking at Link or Link looking at them is nothing new, but I don't think we've seen an NPC look at another NPC like this. Again, showing a general increased level of awareness that they have with each other and the world in general. It really makes the world feel more alive. Moving on, we get Act 3 of the Tapestry, where we see a town being formed complete with citizens. Again, showing the progress of this world. It then fades away to an actual town, or rather a village, as it doesn't appear to be the same town based on the different architecture style. But the village here is no less interesting, as it appears to be built in a valley with beautiful waterfalls as the backdrop. And it seems to be a pretty decently sized village too, with at least 8 buildings. Here, 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 and one really well hidden one in the back here. And that may not even be all of them, because throughout the town, we can see these clothesline-like things strung about. 
and there just happens to be one above that hidden building that continues off screen, suggesting there may be even more buildings than what we can see here. Now we actually get a couple different angles of this village, so keep an eye on the building here for instance, as it's the same one in this other scene, which offers a view from the opposite side of the village, and this angle might just reveal the entrance to the town right here. Now this village seems pretty focused around agriculture, I mean we can see a couple of roosters or cuckoos hanging around like the one here, and another inside the shed here from the alternate angle, and then there's a garden full of vegetables here with someone even tending to them. And speaking of people, we can see another villager just below gazing at some trees. We can also see a signpost nearby, I wonder what it says. And then, near the front of the village, there's a water wheel connected to this building, which might mean this could be some kind of mill perhaps. And speaking of buildings, we're guessing the large one in the back is probably pretty important, given its size and prime real estate location on an island surrounded by waterfalls connected only by a bridge to the mainland, and it's lit with torches. So we wouldn't be surprised if this were, say, the mayor's house or something equally important. So I think that about covers it for the village, so let's move on to the next scene, and it's a major one. And not just because it's Link's first actual appearance in the trailer so far because we're also introduced to a brand new character, a bird person, which isn't to be confused with THE bird person. And it appears it may be some kind of warrior based on what looks to be a bow on his back. In fact, the whole thing reminded us a little bit of this bird enemy from Zelda The Adventures of Link, but we'd be surprised if that's intentional. Especially since he isn't the only bird person in the game, as the Game Awards demo revealed another, suggesting these birds will have a major presence. Plus the one in the demo is clearly not even an enemy, so could these bird people be a new form of Rito from Wind Waker perhaps? Although, there is a fact that the two bird people here appear as if they may be different species entirely. Then again, they could just both be part of a larger animal family. Regardless, there's a few more interesting things about the bird person's appearance here, such as how, like Link, he has braided hair, or braided feathers rather. But instead of Link's blue ring hairband thing, he uses a green one instead. But interestingly, that green color seems pretty prominent on him, as it matches the green rings around his ankles, and also his eye color. Just like how Link's blue hairband matches his blue earrings and blue eyes. Now we did speculate before that the blue color might tie into Link's connection with the game's technology, which is of course powered by blue energy. And assuming that's the case, which, you know, very well may not, could the green color on the bird here have some deeper meaning too? The color green has historically been used to represent magic in the games after all. Now look, we're not saying he has magic abilities. The green color scheme could just be an art style choice. But, the bird person does emerge from within a whirlwind that appears to be of his creation. And that's a pretty big whirlwind. I mean, that's an impressive feat no matter how you slice it, but it would be even more so if there's no magic involved at all. At the very least, we'd be surprised if his visual parallels to Link are entirely coincidental. Now, besides the green rings, he's wearing a blue scarf too. And if we freeze the video at just the right time, we can see it has a symbol of a bird on it. And that symbol is interesting for a couple of different reasons. For one, it looks similar to the Hylian Crest, which itself is retconned to have been inspired by the Loftwings. So could that maybe be a hint that instead of being a new form of Rito, they might instead be the evolution of the Loftwing? Furthermore, even the ends of his bow appear to be reminiscent of the Hylian Crest too. But whether or not this guy's related to Loftwings, that icon also matches the general appearance of the object that the bird person flies to, which is to say, a giant airship in the shape of a bird. It even shares the five tips on each wing of the bird icon. Anyways, we can see the airship is held up by giant propellers, which we get a close-up look at in this scene. There's three on each wing, plus two more closer to the head. Now as for what the airship is actually for, well, we have no idea. Is it the home base of the bird people perhaps, or just this one specifically? And can Link maybe use it himself to get around? Nintendo has called this an open-air game after all, but your guess is as good as ours. But here's something interesting, because this probably isn't the first time we've seen that airship. Like, not even close to the first time. Because we think that airship and the so-called floating island that could be seen from all over the plateau in the E3 demo may be one and the same. Look, there's its head and its legs. Now here's something else interesting, because even though the trailer provides both zoomed out as well as close-up shots, they don't appear to be from the same point in the game. Because, if we zoom in during the far out shot, we can see it's powered by the same blue energy as the other technology in the game. But, in the close up shot, it's red instead. Like the Guardians. Which obviously means something changed at some point. And, as you might remember from our last analysis, we think of my indicate that's been taken control of or corrupted by Ganon. But one thing we're not sure about is the order of events. I mean, does the bird person scene come first before the airship turns red? Or is it the opposite, with the ship being restored to its former blue self after the close up shots? It's obviously impossible to say for sure, but there is something else here that may provide some clue about the timing. Because, if you freeze a bird person scene at the very start, we get a close up look at Link's sword. Except it's not just any sword, but the Master Sword, as made clear by the trademark hilt. Oh, and the sheath even bears a logo of the Triforce too. At any rate, the fact that Link has a Master Sword here might suggest that the bird person sequence happens comparatively late in the game, since the Master Sword generally isn't acquired until at least a third of the way through the game. 
Of course, the airship could have still turned red after this point too. So yeah, I guess it doesn't help too much in figuring out the exact order of events. But the fact that the ship's blue in this scene does suggest it was built to be friendly, much like all the other technology in the game. Which could possibly mean that the bird person's an ally. Unless of course he's helping Ganon take control of it or something. I mean, he does fly right up to it, and the shots of the airship afterward are in red. God, it's all so perplexing! Clearly this is a future problem for a future analysis machine to deal with. Now there is one more feature about the airship that's unusual, and that's a claw-like apparatus underneath. What is that? Is it just decoration? Or could it be used for grabbing things? Or maybe it's a docking bay of sorts. Anyways, to move on a bit, this entire scene takes place with Link standing atop some kind of wooden platform. But interestingly, that platform has two gaps in the railing, like it was made for boarding something. So is it possible the airship can dock here for Link to step on or something, or, you know, head inside? Alternatively, it also reminded us of the wooden platforms in Skyloft from Skyward Sword, where Link can leap off of them to catch a ride in his bird friend, a Loftwing. Now, we're not saying the bird person here serves the same purpose, but maybe. At the very least, it might be a good launching off point for Link's glider. Now, the final big question we have about this scene is where exactly in the world does it take place? And while it's impossible to peg it precisely, we think we may have a rough idea. Because if we assume the airship and the floating island are one and the same, well, we peg that floating island as being precisely here in the northwest corner of the world. Well, at least at that moment in time. Remember, it does move around a bit. Now, on top of that, we can also see pine trees off in the distance which is something we've also seen located to the northwest, such as on what we dubbed the Green Mountain just to the south of the Floating Island, as well as in the Snowy Mountain to the north. And given that the two regions here are two of the ones we know the least about, we wouldn't be surprised if this scene does in fact take place somewhere within them. Okay, and that finally covers it for that scene, so let's return to the Tapestry movie for Act 4, where we can see Hyrule Castle just before a bunch of Guardians appear too which likely signifies their reawakening, presumably under Ganon's control. Hence again, why they appear purple. And this is further compounded by the fact that the scene immediately after shows his guardians attacking Link. But based on that, specifically the fact that the trailer presents the technology in this manner being antagonistic, we think it may actually provide some clarity on the order of events with regard to the airship. Yeah, I lied, we're not done with it yet. Because given the tone and the context of the trailer around this point, we think it signifies the airship going from being pure to being corrupted or possessed by Ganon especially with how the music drops out completely during the airship scene, until it returns with a vastly different tone the moment the airship turns red. Which provides a musical link that continues through the tapestry scene and to the end of the trailer. Hey, and speaking of the airship, we can actually see it make a cameo in the following scene with the Guardians. Again, assuming it and the Floating Island are the same thing. Anyways, there really isn't too much to say about the Guardian battle here, as it closely matches the one we already covered from E3. Especially since it seems to be in the same general location, around this tower in the field. But come on, you know us, there's still a few things to point out. Such as how there are two active Guardians this time, which is something we haven't seen before. And not only that, but they're both actively targeting Link at the exact same time, as we can see both lasers honing in. Now while it might not seem fair being two on one, Link still has a few tricks up his sleeve. Because for the first time, we can see that Link is able to attack the tentacles directly. Now at first, it looks like the tentacle might have been dismembered completely. But upon replay, it seems to stay attached. But it still seems to have made some kind of major impact. And not just because of that awesome sound. But also because the Guardian lights up when hit. Plus, the entire game slows down to show the true impact of the strike. So we really wouldn't be surprised if he actually can dismember the tentacles completely, or at the very least harm or disable them. In fact, the impact is so strong, it might have even made the second Guardian react to it. I mean, check this out. Right after Link strikes a tentacle, the other Guardian does a short hop. Now, it could be entirely coincidental, but it would be pretty darn neat if Guardians reacted to each other. And assuming it is, is it reacting because it saw it? Or could it be because the Guardians might be linked to some kind of network, as we theorized with the shrines and towers, where maybe interacting with one affects all the others? It would provide a good explanation as to how they were all corrupted or possessed if Ganon only had to take control of a single point, thereby affecting the others. You know, kind of like how taking down the Mothership and Independence Day destroyed all the others too. So that about covers it for this scene, so let's move on to the next one. Whoa, that kinda looks like Link. Except that's clearly not Link for at least a couple of reasons. So who is that? Whoever it is, we're guessing it's someone pretty important based on the fact the trailer's purposely hiding their face. So could this be Zelda maybe? Zelda is generally portrayed with long dirty blonde hair like she is here. Plus the gold spots on her glove and outfit aren't exactly an argument against it. But it's impossible to say for sure, I mean it could be a new character too. But what we do know is that she's holding something in her hands. And based on its size, as well as a brown color with red streaks, we're pretty darn sure it's a Sheikah Slate. But is it her own, or did she get a hold of Link somehow? Maybe she's even walking into Link right now. Again, who knows? 
Moving on, the next scene shows an explosion of red energy emitting from Hyrule Castle, which is pretty clearly related to Calamity Ganon. So could this be Calamity Ganon's great escape, finally having broken free of the castle's prison as forewarned by the old man? It might be. The trailer then seemingly implies that this event leads to the destruction of the nearby town, which we know is nearby since we can see Hyrule Castle right there in the background. And that destruction comes complete with menacing looking pillars sticking out of the ground and purple energy that surrounds them. The only problem with this interpretation is that we already know much of the world is left in ruin by Ganon 100 years earlier before Link awakens in the shrine. As in, we seriously doubt this town still exists in a state in which it could be destroyed. So instead, maybe the town is already in a state of ruin, and the energy exploding from the castle merely makes the pillars and purple energy appear too. Another possibility is that despite the order of the scenes, maybe they're not directly connected at all. So for instance, maybe the castle scene is in fact showing Ganon's escape while the town scene might be from before that happens. That would explain why the castle in the background of the town scene still looks just as it does in the E3 footage, with Ganon's energy still surrounding it. Then again, it's possible the energy could still surround the castle even after Ganon's escape. Like, maybe he maintains it as a base of operations or something. Or maybe he's not escaping at all, and the explosion is just a sign of his increasing strength. There's a lot of possibilities, including one more, and it's a big one. Because what if the scene of the exploding castle doesn't take place in the modern day at all? Instead, what if it's a flashback? back to when Ganon originally caused devastation all over Hyrule 100 years ago. Now, if this is the case, it might only apply to the castle scene and not the town scene, because we can actually see a couple of blue towers behind the town indicating Link's already activated them, which would seemingly point to it being the present day. Although, it is possible that's how those towers originally appeared before they receded underground. But there's also the fact that we can just barely see a guardian rummaging around over here too. So, if we assume it is indeed a flashback sequence, this could possibly reveal the events that led to Link being put to sleep in the shrine in the first place. And maybe that's what we're seeing happening in this scene where Link's glowing. Maybe he's being reminded of what happened. And by the way, that glow around Link looks pretty similar to the glowing of the statue of the goddess, which we know from the E3 demo they can interact with and pray to. And we also know from the Game Awards demo that they will appear in multiple places around the world. So maybe those goddess statues are what unlock these memories or flashbacks when Link prays to them. Regardless, Link doesn't seem to have the Master Sword yet, meaning this sequence might take place in the earlier portion of the game. Now, if flashbacks are indeed a thing, it kind of opens a can of worms, as that potentially draws into question of whether every scene in the trailer is a flashback or not. Like the one with the girl here. If it's a flashback, is she carrying the Sheikah Slate to put into the shrine with Link? Who knows? And speaking of the Sheikah Slate, it might actually offer a clue as to which scenes may be flashbacks or not. Because check this out, when we see Link in the bird person scene, the Sheikah Slate, which is normally hanging from his left side, is nowhere to be found. Which is a bit weird considering it's something he gets at the very start of the game. So it shouldn't be missing. Now granted, it's possible the angle here just prevents us from seeing it on his front side. But assuming that's not the case, this being a flashback sequence would not only explain why it's missing, since he hasn't yet received it, but it also makes a lot of sense for a couple of other reasons too. One being the fact that the airship is still blue, meaning it hasn't yet been corrupted or possessed which would make sense if this takes place in the past. But perhaps even more importantly, it might explain why Link has a Master Sword here too. Because going from the game's logo and the E3 trailer, we know that the Master Sword has seen some better days, rusting away in a forest in the modern day. So it would make sense that this is a flashback to a time when Link not only had the Master Sword, but back in a time when it was presumably in pristine condition too. Furthermore, as we said before, the Master Sword is generally a relatively light game acquisition. And we'd be very surprised if that's not the case this time too. Especially because this is a game where Link can equip almost anything as his weapon. And one would think that getting the Master Sword too early would undermine the entire point of that. Because why wouldn't he use a Master Sword? So it again makes sense for this to be a flashback sequence instead of Nintendo showing a late game scene in the trailer. On top of that, if we assume the Master Sword is a potential tell in our flashback theory, then that might mean the trailer's final scene could also be a flashback since Link has it equipped there as well. But unfortunately the camera's a bit too high to confirm whether he's missing the Sheikah Slate here too. So if this is a flashback sequence, that also introduces one more possibility as to who that mysterious character could be. The Old Man. Or should I say, Young Man, since it would be 100 years earlier. Maybe he was royalty at one point before the world went to hell. And related to that idea is an even crazier one. Because it's been suggested that based on the similar appearance, that the Old Man could possibly be King Daphnis from Wind Waker. So could this possibly be a younger version of him? Hey, he did have a thing for red capes, and the person here is wearing one too. Finally, to get back to the scene of Link potentially receiving a memory or flashback, he does indeed have the Sheikah Slate here, which likely confirms at least this scene as the present day, which also explains why he doesn't have the Master Sword here. So maybe when Link comes across the destroyed town, he finds a goddess statue that then reveals a flashback to him. Alright, that's enough about flashbacks for now, but on a somewhat related note, there's another Link to the past in this scene too. 
Because the ruined fountain here appears to be the exact same fountain from Castletown and Twilight Princess. Look, they both have a Hylian crest on a raised platform with a circular base. It's uncanny! So if it's meant to be the same fountain, that could mean that we're looking at the very same castle town too. Especially given the fact that they're both right next to Hyrule Castle too. So between this and the Great Bridge of Hylia that we talked about in past analysis, could this game maybe take place after Twilight Princess? It certainly seems unlikely to take place before. Unless it's part of a different timeline entirely. Which is entirely possible, as there's no real good reason that we can think of that Castletown couldn't exist in another timeline. Okay, that's enough about the timeline for now. It seriously gives me a headache just thinking about it. But what if I told you that that same fountain is also visible in this scene? Don't believe me? Let's zoom way in here. Do you see it there? A tall, partially destroyed structure surrounded by a circular base? Yeah, I know it can be tough to make out, so I don't blame you if you don't fully believe me. But stick with me here for a second. Because do you see those two pillars right here pointing toward the castle? I think those might be the exact same pillars from the fountain scene. Except instead of viewing them from the back, we're now seeing them from the side. Which means we're viewing the fountain from just west of it. Which I base on the fact that the castle has to be to the north, since we can just barely see Death Mountain here in what has to be to the east. Yeah, it's all a bit confusing. Trust me, I sat here looking at this stupid thing for like an hour. But I'm pretty sure I have my directions right. In which case, this would place Castletown just slightly to the southwest of Hyrule Castle. Or somewhere around here on the map. But here's the weird thing. I poured over every image I could find of Hyrule Castle as viewed from the plateau. And as far as I can tell, there's nothing in the spot where Castle Town should be. I wasn't able to find any ruins or anything. I even checked the eastern side too, just in case. Nothing. So what's going on here? Did Nintendo remove Castle Town from the E3 demo so we wouldn't see it? Or is it just too far away to be visible? Or perhaps it's being hidden behind a tall hill or something? Or maybe there's something else at play here entirely? I'm pretty baffled. Okay, we're finally almost done here, so on to the final scene, which I already talked about a little bit, but since I recorded it before my old man theory, let's ignore that some of these details may be just a bit redundant. And here we can see Link either sitting or kneeling down or something next to another mysterious figure, whose face we also don't see. So who's this person? They do appear as if they may be royalty, what with a red cape, and what looks like some kind of robe with an ornamental decoration hanging in front. Plus there's a fact that the scene appears to take place by some kind of castle. So, could this person maybe be Zelda instead, or maybe in addition to? I mean, both this person and the girl from earlier had their faces hidden, so could they both be Zelda? Both of them do seem to have a fondness for the color gold, between the gold knuckles here and the gold decorations on this person's glove. But there really is no telling for sure, even if Zelda really hasn't ever been one for capes. Again, it could be anyone. Maybe a new character. Or maybe someone else involved with royalty, like Impa perhaps. Or again, maybe the old man. Whoever it is, we can see them clench their fists at the very end, perhaps out of anger or maybe determination. Okay, so this is about where the video originally ended, but while watching it back before rendering it to post, I had one final idea. Do you remember that scene from the very start of what looked to take place in Autumn? You know, based on the color of the leaves we hadn't seen anywhere else? Could this possibly be a flashback too? It would explain the different seasons, since a flashback doesn't necessarily need to be at the same time of year. Plus it being a flashback also fits within the context of this being a story told of past events via the tapestry. Alright, we're finally done covering everything we could dig up on the Zelda Breath of the Wild Game Awards trailer. But like usual, let us know if we missed anything by posting in the comments below. Oh, and if you want even more, make sure to stay tuned for our upcoming analysis of the Game Awards demo too. And for all of you Game Explained newbies out there, make sure to hit that subscribe button for tons more Breath of the Wild and all things Nintendo too. Alright, catch you later. Bye.